Thanks, Philip. Um, not wearing any hat right now, but if you can just imagine the elk one on. There's actually, I'll be putting the plant head on a bit too. So, um, <clears throat> so you've probably seen elk um, on or near the ranch every time you go by in the winter, more than likely. Um, and private land especially has been a really significant and growing importance um, in the Bitterroot Valley to elk and more widely all over. And um, the, these private lands present management challenges. Um, private landowners, homeowners, as well as ranchers and farmers, and additionally hunters. And all of these groups have interests, different interests in our elk. And, and by our elk, I mean the elk in our area. We don't own them. <clears throat> and so this brings up a lot of questions about how best to manage them. Um, specifically on the ranch, we've seen about a 25% increase um, during the first three years of um, observations. Um, in the fourth season, there was an increasing trend, not quite the 25% level. Um, and then finally, this year so far, we're about on par with last year. Um, so numbers aren't dramatically decreasing. The increasing trend is continuing. So a few questions that I've been wondering and maybe you've been wondering as well. Um, what is the history of elk in the Bitter Valley? This is very important in understanding the grand scheme of things, what elk are doing now compared to what they were doing long ago. How do forage availability and nutrition change throughout the winter? And then how does diet and forage selection change? And finally, where are elk spending time in relation to these other questions? So to address the first question, the Bitterroot elk herd can trace its roots back to a reintroduction in 1912. There were about 50 animals, mostly cows. Um, and they were actually brought in and paid for by um, a sportsman's association in Stevensville. Um, and from this small group and decades of management to grow the population, we've had the bitter elk um, maxed out around 2005, around 8,100 elk. So, um, you know, people are generally pretty happy about that, some more than others. Um, specifically, Hunting District 204, which is where most of the ranch is, um, sees a similar increasing trend. There are, with smaller areas like hunting districts, there's always going to be some movement of elk, and so you won't have the sort of broad trend line that you will over a larger area. But again, increasing trend in general. <clears throat> and so elk are... Um, heavily using the ranch and the private land adjacent to it, but they're by no means set or forced to stay within the boundaries. And you can see, this is a map showing um, elk locations on one day, January 15th of this year, during an aerial flight. And you can see large groups, small groups, they're spread out all over the valley. Um, there's a busy highway, Highway 93, there's a river, and then there's elk on both sides. So how much are they moving? We're not really sure. Um, we can definitely tell that um, they're not all successful. Uh, if you can't read the sign, maybe you're going too fast or maybe the picture's not very good. But it says um, wildlife crossing ahead. And <clears throat> here you can actually see two elk just south of that sign, which is at the southern end of Lolo. And they're um, crossing the railroad tracks, which is right near the highway. There's one, and here's the other one. And there's way over here, there's a, a, the rest of the herd. <clears throat> and you may have also seen some fatalities given these crossings. And so this is of interest to biologists and, again, all of these other interested groups. And so the Northern Sapphire Elk Research Project has been formed over years of, of hoping and um, research. And the general district, the general area covered is highlighted in blue here. And this is region two. And the ranch is kind of right in the central part of this. Um, so researchers have been capturing elk, some on the MPG property. And 
you can see here, there's one across the valley just at the bottom of the ski hill. Um, and the elk that was collared is here. And she's recovering. Um, so there are 65 collared elk in total in this um, research project, 45 cows and 20 bulls. There are, um, for each of these captured elk, they take a blood sample, have age estimates, body condition of cows to help um, determine likelihood of pregnancy. And then these radio collars will be active for 104 weeks and there's a mortality sensor with each one should something happen. Um, and the, this project is expected to last for at least three years. Um, and there will also be vegetation monitoring components starting this summer, as well as fecal pellet collection. And this will help get an idea of the foraging habits of the elk. And the general goal of this project is just to inform biologists about movement um, between, again, between these two sides of the valley, um, the use of private lands, and then finally to help shape hunting regulations in the future. So on the ranch, you're probably familiar with the grid system we have laid out, adding layers of information kind of to help get at the interactions between wildlife and plants, which is of interest to me and many others. Um, so each observation of elk is tied to one of these grid points, the nearest one. Um, and over the course of what is now almost three complete seasons, we've had over 190 survey days. And at each of these subset of points on the map here, there's about 150. Um, we've also taken um, pellet samples and counted pellets as well as collect plant biomass. And this is to get at forage availability and nutritional um, intake of elk. So the collection of these pellets and the counting of pellets can help us infer where elk have been. And this map shows the first count that was taken, which kind of gets a hint at the historical presence of elk, so elk use over many years. And we have a range of numbers at each of these points, 37 being the highest, which is at point 108 here, and what used to be crested and is now well, it's not very much right now, but hopefully it will be growing something soon, Dan. And uh, 16 here is kind of in the middle, and that's, for instance, right here, just above the center pivot. And then some of these smaller dots have just one elk pellet found at them. Um, so along with um, these numbers and counts, we can also get an idea of the forage that these um, elk have been utilizing. And so a dietary analysis was conducted, which can actually sort of reconstruct what makes up these fecal pellets. And a few of the important ones, or ones that are of interest, are rough fescue, which is found in usually very intact native communities. Um, on the other hand, compressed bluegrass, which is found in lower elevation typically, um, or very disturbed areas. And wheat grasses, which can be blue bunch, which is a native, or it can be intermediate wheatgrass, which is a forage grass. So to get an idea of what this means, it's kind of helpful to look at the grand scheme of what elk are generally eating. And right off the bat, probably wheat sticks out, and wheat and corn tend to be those seasonal um, forage for elk. So they'll be eating them quite a bit early in the fall when they're available, once they're not available they shift. Um, and then Idaho fescue here in purple and rough fescue also make up pretty important sections um, of this overall average of elk diet. And then Forbes here in brown um, also is one of those seasonal shifters that tends to start out somewhat large and then decrease to almost nothing as winter progresses. So. Thinking about these valued forage species that we found in elk pellets, um, you can kind of, if you look at where these species occur on the ranch, it gives you an idea for where some, where some of these elk are spending their time. So compressed bluegrass will be, again, lower elevation, disturbed communities. It's actually a really great competitor and can grow in places where nothing else grows. This is on the floodplain, but it can also be 
up higher along roads, um, areas like that. Um, to contrast that with Idaho fescue, it's, it almost cuts off at exactly that elevation line where compressed bluegrass likes to be. And it tends to be in a bit more native communities. It can handle some disturbance, um, and it's pretty ubiquitous. So that one's a nice um, available forage for the most part. And finally, rough fescue, which it has been pointed out that it is typically not a large component of elk diet, but um, specifically for bull, um, bull elk and elk that are ranging a bit more widely, um, it, it can often make up a large percentage. Some of our samples were taken from bulls, and it, rough fescue made up almost 60% of a diet in, in one pellet sample. So normally, I think it would be closer to around 2%, which is what we found for the average overall um, in a larger cow group. But you can see rough fescue um, is growing in, in a pretty different and distinct area. So it's growing in draws, um, higher elevation, some of the edge habitat that you're not likely to see, groups of two, 300 elk. So putting this all together, it's really kind of nice to see this gradation of what's available. And so when you think about what species are growing where, and then where you actually see elk, you can kind of start putting these things together. So this, these two maps show um, the frequency of observations at each of these points and their proportional symbols. So this largest dot shows that um, there have been elk sighted eight different times at that specific location. And so you see on both, in both years that there's a pretty high number of elk in these kind of large open areas. And these tend to be larger groups of elk as well. Um, and then you have outliers with a few, like one count maybe, and those tend to be smaller groups, bachelors, and, um, and again, so these open areas, typically most of what is being eaten is in disturbed or open areas that have been grazed previously. And additionally, another way to look at this is the variation within a season in each of two years. So I'll show you 2011 and 12. And you can see some similarities. Um, in fall, the red dots show use just in October and November. Winter is in blue, and then areas that have been used in both seasons are in purple. So again, there's a concentration in this middle high visibility area of the ranch, and a few outliers here in some of the higher elevation and edge habitats. And if we look at 2012, a similar scheme, but um, things are different. You know, I mean, there's so many factors affecting elk. It's, it's actually really quite difficult to show how widely they range. Um, but you can get a feeling that, again, the, these central parts are really the most highly inhabited. <clears throat> so this elk group size it really reflects the survival strategies. Um, and so as I've been saying, cows, calves, and young bulls tend to group up together. Um, right after the rut, you know, they'll all be in large open areas, and they can be in groups as large as 480, which is our max that we saw last year. On the other hand, bulls are ma not maximizing so much security as they are forage potential, especially right after the rut when they're trying to maximize their replenishment of their fat and protein stores. And so they'll often be in small groups together, and they'll be hanging out in these edge habitats and um, some of those outlying areas. So habitat um, influences this elk behavior that we've been talking about as far as their survival strategies um, and may, might sort of explain some of these um, management implications that the elk research project and, and my research is trying to get at, which is why are elk spending time, more time on private land and where are they spending this time? What are they eating? And so, Habitat influences elk behavior, but elk behavior can also influence habitat. When you have these groups of 480 elk and they're consistently using the same areas, you might see degradation of these areas. So we want to maintain healthy movement of elk. We want to have, you know, 
as much dispersal as possible when they should be dispersing. So with that, um, I'd like to thank Philip and Bo and Dan for kind of giving some aid and thinking critically about these questions. Field crew for helping me out, collecting samples, and the Gurness family. And Washington State University did the pellet analysis. <laughs>